see Mr. Bobo. Okay, Mr. Bobo, you're up. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, may it please the court and counsel, I'm Alan Bobo for the appellant and the plaintiff below. Your Honor, may I reserve five minutes for rebuttal, please? You may. <clears throat> Your Honor, this, this action presents an unusual occurrence from the trial court. There was an eviction action that was tried in the county court. Following the trial of the eviction action, the circuit court dispersed disputed rents from this circuit court case. This case filed in circuit court is a class action to determine the reasonableness of rents in a mobile home park for a specific rental agreement that began on May 1, 2007. By statute, only the circuit court can try an unreasonable rent case. The Mobile Home Act limits that authority to the circuit court in 723.0381. So we can't go to the county court and try the case that's before you today. <clears throat> but as a result of the county court's judgment, the court in the circuit court, acting in the circuit court, actually released disputed rent monies to the tenant that's involved in this particular case. This 2007 circuit court action arose from a rent dispute, Your Honors. There was in 2007, the Naples Estates Homeowners Association and the mobile home park owner were absolutely knee deep in litigation. There were several cases that were pending between them. In 2007, the mobile home park owner increased the rent. The Homeowners Association acted appropriately. They were represented by counsel that's seasoned in this area. And they filed a notice under the rent deposit statute that the homeowners wouldn't pay the disputed rent to the mobile home park owner. That notice was a prerequisite for anybody to withhold rent from the mobile home park owner. You fast forward a little bit and the circuit court entered a rent deposit order and ordered the disputed rents to be placed within the court registry. That dispute or that deposit order was appealed to this court and affirmed. So we had a binding order requiring the residents to place the money into the court registry. Now, importantly, that deposit order was tailored for this particular case. We had literally hundreds of people who were engaging in this rent withholding or this rent strike at the time. They were paying different sums of money. There were just different circumstances between them all. So the easiest way to approach it from a class action standpoint was to simply have the court determine what an appropriate rent was. And in this case, the court said an appropriate rent was either $600 or $610 for a premium site. I'm only going to talk about the $600 because the tenant below had a $600 ruling by the court. So the tenant below, as well as all of the residents of Naples Estates who wanted to dispute the rent, had an option. They had an opportunity. They could either pay all the money to the mobile home park owner, in which event they would satisfy the condition for them participating in this class action lawsuit, or they could put literally whatever they wanted to into the park owner's hands so long as they paid the remaining balance between what they were paying to the park owner and the $600 into the court registry. So every resident had that option, including the tenant below. Now, the tenant here elected to participate in the class action lawsuit by withholding money from the mobile home park owner. As we often say, they voted with their checkbook and refused to pay the park owner and elected to participate in the lawsuit. They made one payment into the court registry. A payment I'm going to round off was about $10,000. After they made that one payment, they stopped. There were no more payments into the court registry in connection with this particular lawsuit. So they quit. Now, they continued to pay the park owner less than the $600 that was ordered by the court, but they just didn't put the remaining balance into the court registry as the deposit order required. As a result of that, there was a default then, not only in the court's deposit order, but also in the rent deposit statute for mobile home parks, 723063. And an eviction action was instituted against the tenant. The tenant, during the pendency of the eviction action, voluntarily moved from the mobile home park, leaving only the damage claim available in the county court. So the county court judge, sitting as a county court judge, tried 
the damage portion of the case and appropriately entered judgment on behalf of the mobile home park owner for the difference during a certain period of time for the amount that the tenant had paid to the park owner versus the amount that it put in, into the court registry. And let, let me, can I focus on, on that discrete issue uh, here, Mr. Bobo? The county court action included, for whatever reason, there was included within that not only eviction, but a damage component. They saw damages in that in the county court action, correct? Yes, sir. And in the rents case that we're here on now, there they saw the, uh, the same plaintiff seeking damages, correct? No, sir. Okay, different no, sir. plaintiff. Yet, no, sir. And what happened in this, in, in the particular case that's before you today, is when, when Mr. Colling, the homeowners association's lawyer, when Mr. Colling gave me certified mail notice that they were not going to pay the money into the court registry, mm -hmm. then at that point, we set up uh, basically what the controversy was going to be to the trial court. So the park owner filed a declaratory judgment action against the homeowners association under rule 1.222 and said, judge, we believe that our rent that we're charging the residents is reasonable. And we would like the court to enter a declaratory judgment that the rent we're charging is reasonable. So that is what is set up before you here. Okay, I, thank you for the clarification. But it is without dispute though, that we've got not only, not only is this the same lease that we're talking about vis-a-vis -vis Ms. Garbachik, I guess is how you say it, but there's actually an overlap of time between the county court action and, and the declaration you're seeking on the rents case of, my math isn't good, but almost like three years. I, I think literally you know, it's like the same relief is being sought in a county court action, a circuit court. How is this not splitting a cause of action? No, sir, it, it is not. First of it's all, it is, there is the overlap that you said, but there was no allegations in connection with this case of anything having to do with unreasonable rent. When you say this is the same lease, no, sir, it's not. In a mobile home park, the rental agreements are by statute for a period of one year. Mm. So when we increased the rent in 2007 and the residents said, we're not going to pay you any longer, then these cases are very similar to a condemnation case. Then if, they, if, the, if the residents claim the rent is unreasonable, then they're going to bring in experts. And those experts are going to testify that neighboring parks are charging this amount of money. We're going to bring in an expert that's going to say neighboring parks are charging this. The court will ultimately make a determination as to what a reasonable rent structure is going to be. That's what this case before you is. We did. We weren't trying. The reason was for the rent. There was no defense here well, at all. And, and that's that's OK. So that discrete part of the problem wasn't in play in the rents case, but it's the same tenant. It's the same property. And there's a three year overlap between the time period for which you are claiming you didn't get paid. That's what I'm struggling with is. Gosh, that sure sounds like you're splitting up your causes of action in, in two different places going at the same time. The trial court did not and could not, from a jurisdictional standpoint, determine whether the, the relief that we requested in this case could be granted. The trial court could not make a determination like we had here that the rent was either reasonable or unreasonable under the terms of the, the, the Florida Mobile Home Act. That had to be tried in the trial or in the circuit court in this case. That's the only place that that could be tried. I'm not so sure that the trial court made that determination that you just articulated because your complaint alleges expressly that they owe between from May 1st, 2007 to September 9, 2013, which was the deadline of the rents case order to deposit into the registry of the court. I do note that you filed this complaint in 2015 for an alleged breach back in 2007. There seems to be a statute of limitations problem there, but nobody raised it. But the point is you've argued to us that the homeowners have put in $10,000 
uh, due to the rents case order and then stopped paying, but yet paid their rent, you articulated that you were owed 6,900 so dollars for from May 1st of 2007 to September 2013, which is a result of the rents case order. And you were awarded a judgment, a money judgment. And your complaint is replete with references to the rents case order. And it's undisputed, this homeowner has paid into it. You've been compensated. What right do you have to the rest of the money? No, sir, we have not been compensated. You were compensated in this particular complaint. You asked for $6,900 and you got a, you got a money or judgment award. For a finite period. Of and you're time. saying that you're still entitled to what's left in the registry based on what proposition of law? For a finite period of time, we were awarded disputed rents. For another period of time, the money is sitting in another case. Your Honor, the record shows in this case that there's about $1.4 million that's sitting in this case. And that is sitting in this case for determination from the unreasonable rent action. We couldn't is, get that, that case. That here. case, that case appears as if it will never resolve. That case has been going on forever. I couldn't tell you how many appeals we have in this particular case. And I want to express to you the concern that this court has, and I'm serious, because we have so many appeals from that case and nothing has been done on the class action. So go ahead and continue. Okay. Your Honor, the trial court effectively kicked this tenant as a putative class member out of the bunch and basically awarded this tenant, uh, basically ruled that this tenant wins. This resident stopped paying the money to the mobile home park owner and did not put all that money into the registry of the case in, in the eviction case. The only way I could get the disputed rent from the period May 1, 2007 to now is to move in the 2007 case and seek that money. The court effectively ruled for the tenant in that case by giving the tenant the disputed money that the resident had put into this particular class action case. The court it, didn't I mean, have- I, the, the problem is, Mr. Bobo, and, and I'm not saying that you're not reading the tea leaves right, you may be, but you're asking us to make legal determinations based upon effectively making one person a putative class representative and then effectively making a ruling on that. We really like a lot more certainty when we are being told a trial court aired and we need to publish an opinion reversing that trial court. It, it's really difficult to ask us to read between the lines to figure out what's going on in this other, albeit related litigation in the way you're suggesting. I'm, I'm just being candid with you. Let, let me follow up on that point. None of these issues were brought up in trial. I mean, none of the things that we're really arguing about today were brought up in trial. What happened in this case is the court allowed us to do written closing arguments. For the first time in the tenant's closing argument, the, the tenant asked the court to release the money that was in the 2007 case. So that's how this came up. You have already had two cases before you that we gave you supplemental authority on, because I don't really understand how the court made this ruling. This judge has been very good at, at handling this deposit order. He's been very good at handling these cases one point at a time. He has respected the deposit order in every part of it. In fact, a few months before we came in, as Judge Sleet said, we were before this court on two other cases. Those cases are Natalie and Stallmaker, that we put in our, our motion for supplemental, our notice of supplemental authority. Those two tenants went to this trial judge and we actually had a hearing where they petitioned the court to release their money from the court registry. The court refused. Then those cases were appealed to you and it was appealed on an interlocutory basis and you affirmed the trial court's refusal to disperse money from the court. So this is not something everybody was asleep at the switch on. The only reason this happened the way it happened 
is there was a notation, a sentence put into a written closing argument that said, hey, judge, disperse the money out of the 2007 case. Well, the court didn't have the authority to disperse that. And when you say that you would like to have some, some more concrete evidence, sir, I would too. If, if, the, if the court is going to consider- You are the litigants though, I'm not. I can't make this, I can't tee this case up for trial or final evidence you're hearing, whatever needs to happen, you all can. But we have, the, the, the point is, if we're going to affect money, that's being held in no, that trial. sir, that is kind of the point because you're asking us to construe some discrete rulings in a way as if they were a final dispositive ruling when they're not. What so I'm suggesting that puts us, that puts us in a very difficult position. You want us to publish an opinion saying, Circuit Court, you erred. And you erred because when I look at some of this other stuff that you did, I construe it in this way, even though you didn't actually make that ruling. Well, well, that, that's, a, a, that's, a, that's kind of a big ask. Well, the, the court made a ruling, though, in an eviction county court case and made a ruling in another case where they didn't have jurisdiction over. We didn't argue it. We didn't present it. If we're going to go, if counsel as an intervenor wants to go into the 2007 case, make a motion that these monies be removed for whatever reason he said. And by the way, there were no defenses raised here, no race judicata, no splitting cause of action, no unreasonable rent, nothing. We just tried a straightforward debt case for a specific period of years. Then the court pivoted, made a right turn and pulled the money out of another case. What I'm saying to you, Judge Lucas is, I would like the opportunity to be heard on that too. I would like to be able to set that up so that we could come back to you. I don't want to be in an eviction case over here and have a ruling in an eviction case that's certainly in line with what I think is going to happen, which we're ultimately Mr. going Bobo, to- you are case. into your rebuttal time. So uh, you use your minutes as you please. Okay, sir. But I, what I'm saying to you, Judge Lucas, is I would like to have this set up as a remand to the trial judge to put the money back into the court registry like it's supposed to be. If we're going to have a hearing in the 2007 case, then let's go through the due process requirements for that hearing. Let us go in and make those arguments. Don't let me get it on a final judgment that's in an eviction case when we're not having anything to do with the trial of this case. This case has its own separate set of lawyers, its own separate set of issues. But the court just turned and hit where we are right now. So that is my problem with this. I mean, this came out of left field for me. And now we've got $1.4 million left, several more of these, a bunch more of these evictions left to go. And we're going to be back before you over whether this is an appropriate process or not for the trial court to enter a judgment in the 2007 case when what is being tried is just an eviction case. And there are two entirely distinct rental agreements and two entirely distinct time periods. With that, I'll, I'll yield for my rebuttal time. May it please the court, uh, Don Christopher on behalf of the uh, Appalese, our Appalee. Um, first off, uh, Judge Sleet, Sleet to uh, respond to your observation about affirmative defenses, we raised the affirmative defense of statute of limitations. Uh, the court disregarded that. If you look at the complaint in the eviction case, the damages sought are from May 1, 2007 up through September. If you look at the demand that was sent to the tenant in June of 2015, it was from May 1, 2007 up through June of 2015. At trial, they claimed their damages were 10,000, whatever that the court ultimately awarded was exactly to the penny what the landlord uh, contended was their damage. They did not appeal that judgment. That judgment is now final. And now they come before this court and say, wait a minute, we're entitled to bring another lawsuit for rent way back beyond the statute of limitations. And we're allowed to get money out of this 2007 rents court case. They have no basis to do that. Um, they, they've already had their big bite at the apple. 
They got a judgment. The judgment's been fully satisfied according to the court orders. And the rest of the money that was sitting in that 2007 case should be returned to the tenants. The tenant's money is, is the trial judge who originally entered the rents deposit order back in June 21 of 2013 observed later, that was the tenant's money until there's a contrary ruling. And I, I can make all the due process arguments that I've made in the numerous other appeals that y'all alluded to, none of which have, have resulted in, in any written opinion to give any guidance to anybody. But in this particular case, again, if we look at the complaint, look at the relief sought, if we look at what was tried and the proof that was put on, they recovered every penny that they claim they entitled to, they were entitled to for unpaid rent under this lease. And that judgment is now final. It hadn't been appealed. And yet they want to appeal a collateral order of the circuit court that said, okay, now, since everything is resolved as far as back rent between the park owner and this particular tenant, there's still money left in the court registry of this tenant. We're going to disperse that remaining money to the tenant. That was entirely proper. We did ask for that in our closing argument. They didn't file any reply to it. They didn't respond to it in any way. They didn't say that that money needs to be preserved. And I would submit to the court that there was no basis for them to bifurcate their cause of action to say, wait, we, we can have one eviction action for uh, years uh, after 2015, but we got to go back to this other class action, which is uh, really a bastard type of proceeding. Uh, I sat there for six years with nothing happening. Uh, my client was not a party to it. It was an involuntary class action against a defendant class that there was no compliance with the statute as far as getting the consent of the purported class members uh, to do that. Now, my client did unwittingly uh, make the de a deposit in accordance with the, in response to the June 21, 2013 order. Um, but again, th they're entitled at this point to get that money back and there's, there's no basis to hold on to it. There's nothing left to adjudicate in that case as regards my client. My client has never been served with uh, process in that case. My client has never gotten notice of the class action, even though in January of 2018, nearly three years ago, the trial court ordered uh, the park owner to give all the class members notice, uh, and that hasn't been done, and that action has been totally neglected. So I think that the court's order in this case uh, directing the uh, refund, uh, the remaining balance of the, the uh, deposit in the 2007 case is entirely appropriate. And uh, there, there, there's, there's nothing left to litigate in that case as between my clients and the park owner. And in this eviction case, the damage number that was used is the number that the park owner contended in the 2007 case is the appropriate amount of rent, 2000, uh, I mean, $600 a month. Now we argued in this case, in the eviction case, that they had, by accepting uh, rent from the uh, tenant without objection, without exception, for the period between September of 2013 and June of 2015, that they waived the claim that uh, they were entitled to any more than the tenant actually paid. Well, the trial court didn't agree with that because if the trial court had agreed with our argument that the most was owed was 10 months at $600 a month, uh, $6,000, $6, then that would have been the judgment. But in fact, he added another $3,000. He added the amount that the uh, plaintiff can claim in its eviction action was due it. And so it's uh, actually the, the, we might have had a cross appeal of, of that other complaint, but as 
the courts are already alluded to, we've taken many, many appeals, raised many, many issues, and have never gotten a uh, definitive ruling or even any kind of uh, comment uh, from this court on it. So we figured it was futile at that point to uh, question the trial court's award of the $600 a month for all those months uh, that um, the tenant actually paid directly to the park owner, but didn't pay up to $600 a month. And the park owner argues that the June 21, 2013 order required the, the residents to pay $600 a month going forward. I submit that that is totally and completely incorrect. The order doesn't mention anything about rent payments after September of 2013. All it says is by September of 2013, you have to deposit the difference between what you contend you paid to the park owner and $600 a month. And these, these residents weren't even given the proper amount to deposit. There's nothing, there's no notice on that. They were just sent a copy of the, the June 16th order. So I submit how as a layman, much less a trained lawyer to read that order and, and discern that, oh, going forward, you have to pay $600 a month. If that's what they meant, they, sh they should have asked the trial judge to clarify that and say that in that order. But now after the fact, they're saying, oh yeah, everybody knew that you were supposed to pay $600 a month and you didn't after September 13th, even though you made a deposit in there in accordance with the strict orders of the, of, of the uh, court. Um, that is, uh, 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 that's inherently uh, unfair to these tenants and violates their right of due process. But in this case, as I said, they filed a complaint for back rent. They filed a complaint for back rent to May of 2013, 2007. They, uh, had, we had a trial. They put on the amount of back rent that they contended was due. The trial judge more awarded that full amount of back rent. And based on the, the amount that my clients had deposited in the eviction action, there was only a difference of, I believe, 245 and some odd dollars, something like that. And the judge said, okay, you can take the rest of that from the deposit that remains in the rents case, and the balance goes back to the homeowner. What, what could be better? It was, if it, in effect, a de facto gar garnishment. And there's no basis to reverse the trial court's order in this case. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Christopher. Mr. Bobo, you have about four minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, I, I think counsel just made a mistake, but when he said that what we had asked for in this eviction case went back to May of 2007, that's incorrect. Um, exhibit two to the complaint is the statement of account that was attached to the complaint. That's also the statement of account that was used in the eviction trial. We asked for money from July the 10th I mean, July 2010 forward, we did not go back and hit the rental agreement that is in effect in this particular case. If you look at the court's final judgment for damage in paragraph number one, the court ordered damages from September 2011 through April of 2016. So the court in its order actually recognized that the court wasn't going back to the 2007 case and adjudicating that 2007 case. And that's where the, the left turn, the pivot hat hits, and he releases this resident's money from another case that is not even tried. That deposit order that we, we had required us to accept less than the full 600 ordered by the court, but it also required the tenant to put the money in. In the cases that were before you earlier, the Stallmaker and the Tally cases, Judge Lucas, at least in those cases, it was done correctly. At least in those cases, counsel moved in the 2007 case to ask the judge to release those monies. The judge refused to do so. And this court, the second district, affirmed that ruling, not releasing the money. At that point in time, we think, okay, the money is safe. 
at least we can go forward with the 2000 case that we know this $1.4 million is going to be safe because the court's not going to release it. I did not expect in any respect that the money was going to be released to somebody in an unrelated eviction case. At least we had the opportunity in that case to come in and argue and we could present the facts to you so that you could make you know, a, a reasoned decision on this. But I hope you appreciate the point from our side is we try an eviction case, which we don't even go back before July 2010, and then we get a ruling that disperses disputed rents back in 2007. The case law is crystal clear that money, disputed rental money placed into a court registry is supposed to remain there until the case is decided. We haven't tried this case. We haven't given the court evidence of whether this rent is reasonable. More importantly, the residents haven't given the court any indication that it's unreasonable. And the answer that was filed was a pro se answer and it didn't raise any of these issues. So I would like to bring it back to the court on a hearing that was in the appropriate case where we could make the appropriate arguments that you can't release this money before the 2007 case is concluded. So your honor, I would suggest that the way you reverse here is we know the trial court didn't have jurisdiction in the eviction case as sitting as a county court judge to make a ruling that affected an unreasonable rent case at 723.081. That can only be made by the circuit judge. Now, I would like the opportunity to be able to make an argument if the court is getting ready to do that. We didn't have that come up in the trial court. We didn't have the opportunity to raise those issues or the jurisdictional issues. What we have in this particular case is a one-year rental agreement under 723.031, one-year rental agreement. And the question is whether our rent was reasonable in that case. This court did not have the jurisdiction to be able to decide that case in an unrelated county court case filed in 2015. That- Dr. Bobo, you've used up your time. Thank you, your honors. I appreciate it. Thank you both. In order to leave the courtroom, there's a leave button in the lower right corner of the Zoom screen. Just click that and you're out of here.